Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along today. My name is Alex Smith. I'm head of media and entertainment solutions architecture for Amazon Web Services Asia Pacific. With me on stage today is Aaron Lovell, head of post-production for Amazon Studios. And what we're going to be talking about today is some of the challenges in dealing with 4K video and how you also can take those lessons to help you eventually win an Emmy Award as well. Um, now, when we talk about processing, or sorry, when we talk with any reInvent talk, the first thing that we really like to frame is, is the problem statement, is, is what we're trying to address. And for 4K video, for any kind of large, high quality video, it's actually quite similar to dealing with HD content as well. But the problem really is just that it's bigger. Where you're dealing with UHD content, the individual file sizes just start to become out of control. You still have to do many of the same kind of things. You're still ingesting the content into a platform, usually from many different locations worldwide. You're still storing that in a content lake, in a digital asset management system, in a NAS, in a SAN. You're still processing, encoding, running them through your metadata analysis, subtitling, etc. And you still have to distribute them to your partners or to end users. Now, just to help paint a visual picture, the scale of what you're dealing with really has changed from what people see. If you look in the bottom right, you can see DVD. Now, for those not from a media background, those not that familiar with media, you'll know DVD. It's still the highest percentage consumption um, medium worldwide. DVD is typically 480 or 560, sorry, 576 in PAL vertical lines. Now, what 4K actually means is it's nearly or approximately 4,000 virtual lines, uh, vertical lines. So it's just a much bigger scale. It's harder to do because you've got more data. And to look at this from a like-for-like -like comparison, first of all, let's, let's go through some of the terms here. So first of all, the source. This is what you edit with in a studio. This is the highest quality of content you are ever going to have to touch or deal with. And usually for HD, 1080p, this falls at about three gigabits per second. So it's big, but it's not terrifying. Now you're dealing, you downsample that. You put it in a mezzanine format. Mezzanine is the highest quality that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It forms the master for encoding for OTT platforms, pay TV platforms, <coughs> consumption downstream. Now, if we take the mezzanine from HD, this sits at 50 megabits per second. 50 megabits per second, you might also realize, is the smallest direct connect you can have. So it's quite easy to think of moving this around. But to compare this with a compressed mezzanine for 4K content, which sits at 2.5 gigabits per second, it's a much bigger problem to deal with. And what we're really trying to answer today, and the entire point of this talk, is to understand how we can deal with this. And when I say we, specifically, I mean we as Amazon and we as Amazon Studios. So what I'm going to do is hand over to Aaron, who's going to talk us through a little bit about how Amazon Studios has dealt with this problem. Thank you, Alex. Um, so I think it would be good to kind of start with Amazon Studios and let you know that we've had to solve a lot of this from scratch. Uh, we didn't have legacy systems to build off of, of course. Um, we're only three years old. Uh, Disney, Fox, Warner Brothers, those other studios, they've kind of been around for years. They've been iterating and making their systems kind of their post-production and production workflows work to kind of meet the deliverables needs for all their customers around the world, which is generally just broadcast going back to the you know, DVDs kind of size of things. Um, they've solved a lot of problems and it's a good starting point for us, but it's not actually something that we can utilize. Uh, we had to kind of think about things on our own terms. No one, none of the studios are actually using uh, 4K video deliverables at this point. Um, it's basically Amazon and Netflix for the most part. And so we really had to kind of think about our own solution. We had no infrastructure when we started, and then uh, if you know anything about Amazon, we kind of move at a lightning, pa lightning pace, and we started producing content very fast in UHD and in HDR, and then the more content that we started to produce, we started to realize that we were losing kind of grip on our asset management. We were starting to kind of lose the sense of our library, and uh, workflow started to slow down. They started to kind of um, 
we ran into problems that we weren't anticipating and what we ended up having to do was kind of go back to the drawing board and think about an internal homegrown solution that would essentially allow us to scale much easier and work in a 4k environment um, you know from here on out so what we did is we kind of looked at the problem we said well we can't just solve for size because the legacy systems that we are kind of using the post-production workloads that we were using don't quite fit that and so we couldn't just do legacy stuff too and then we had to actually work on a more fundamental approach to everything so what we ended up doing is we broke it down and ended up going piece by piece we looked at the ingestion the storage the processing content processing and then the delivery of all this content and we, that was the way that we were going to actually get more control over our entire asset library. Our asset library, and then to have that control too, we had a very um, high level directive, which was to not stifle creativity, meaning we couldn't pass down draconian rules to people to say, deliver content in this very limited format. We had to be very open towards uh, people who wanted to deliver content from very small production houses and people who wanted to deliver from very large studios. So the workflow challenge was essentially what I just went over. It's ingest, package creation, and delivery. And you'll notice that in between each of those is essentially a quality control step. Um, that's because, uh, much to my chagrin, I kind of you know, we have to actually check all these assets. There's many technical errors that generally come with delivery of final assets. So you have to put in those safety checks in, into all that content and make sure that you're getting a sound um, mezzanine file to work with from beginning to end. So this, our challenge was to figure out how to create a damn solution that works in 4K video and would hit all these steps with quality control at each um, safety part. And then also at the very end, of course, move over to like archiving. Um, keeping a good archive of your content is also beneficial for us in the terms of that it actually creates more um, monetization on the back end. Uh, we could essentially, if the more organized and better archived your content is, it actually opens the door for uh, stock footage uh, resales and distribution of content in a much more streamlined, quicker manner. So we kind of thought about that. And then also there's other challenges that are involved in that pipeline too, which is essentially you have to also be able to give access to internal groups such as marketing, PR, and legal for review and for distribution of assets for a trailer creation and all this other kind of stuff that has to happen. And then there's localization that um, Alex kind of touched on too. You have to send these assets out and you have to repackage them again, get them back in. And it's just a constant cycle of assets in and out. And to manage all that on a 4K level is actually pretty challenging. So what we did, decided to do with this homegrown solution is essentially design a completely AWS-based workflow. Um, us being Amazon Studios, we decided it would be best to kind of stay within that Amazon um, ecosystem, kind of eat our own dog food, so to speak. Um, so our basic workflow overview is very much uh, this. We have external post houses or post vendors who are going to complete a content, uh, comp complete a piece of content. That would be, say, Man in the High Castle, um, a very popular show for us. Um, that post house will essentially create a mezzanine file of a single episode, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 gigs. Um, what we will actually do now is we will have that file ingested into our S3 buckets, and then our S3, our DAM, which is actually, I'll get to in just one second, is Reach Engine. And that DAM, that digital asset management system, is this backbone. It watches those S3 ingestion folders, and it pulls that content into Reach Engine. And then Reach Engine essentially then can kick off a workflow orchestration that essentially can repackage that content in numerous different ways. We just script out some workflows, and then those workflows essentially, we are using Elemental to transcode different flavors of files, and then we put those back into the DAM, and then the very last step would essentially be package and delivery to Amazon Video. Um, we could also package and delivery to 
pretty much any platform. It just happens to be that obviously we are exclusive to Amazon Video. So that's the general workflow of just moving content around. Um, I want to dive down a little bit into ingestion. So the, the first question comes you know, with 4K video is how much harder is it to ingest? Um, and the truth is between HD and 4K video, it's not really that much harder. It's just bigger. Um, we, do, we do use a lot of products to move that content. There is Snowball. I'm going to start with Snowball, actually. Um, 40 to 80 terabytes at a time. It's a very good for archived content that's living on a sand somewhere. You can actually grab that content and throw it up into S3 and very quickly and very efficiently. Um, for more production assets, stuff that's kind of in the works still, uh, we prefer S3 transfer acceleration. Uh, that's really good because it lets you take advantage of the cloud front edge network in order to really improve speeds um, and latency globally. It really works from there. And then AWS Direct Connect is actually a really great tool that we use when you're using a um, facility, pre predominantly, let's say, a very large post house that houses a lot of your content or that does a lot of your post-production workflows for a lot of your content. Enabling them with a direct connect allows you to build that, uh, to bridge that production house um, direct into an Amazon region, and that can allow massive improvements in consistency of performance and a dedication of bandwidth up to like 10 gigabit links. It's really fantastic. <laughs> um, so I, what I didn't touch on here yet is third-party apps. So that's Amazon eating Amazon, <laughs> you know. Um, but the major players in the third party atmosphere are definitely Aspera, Signet, Cloudbeam. And these are really great too. Um, what they obviously do is they don't use the TCP transfer protocols. Um, they kind of, they, instead they use UDP to move content, which actually reduces that chatter and increases performance a lot. And it's predominantly used by all the major media companies, right? Um, Disney. You know, again, all the major studios and all the major houses basically have an, an spare or a signet to move content. So for us, those traditional media ingestion systems, they're great. They don't, what we found is that they're great for moving content, but the pricing models of those did kind of limit us to a degree. Uh, the pricing models for traditional media ingestion, ingestion like Signet and Aspera is basically priced for peak. Um, so you can pay a lot if you're moving a lot of content and you're using that full bandwidth, or you could lower your bandwidth, but you're not taking, and then to limit costs, but then you're not really uh, taking advantage of the full pipelines. So what we ended up doing was we started to look at Amazon S3 transfer acceleration as a alternative option. As Amazon Studios, again, we wanted to make something that just worked for all of our customers. And letting each individual production kind of choose a Spera or choose Signiant or initiate some sort of SFTP transfers, it just wasn't really working for us on a large scale. So what we ended up looking at was um, S3 Accelerate, uh, transfer acceleration because it it gave us some new options that were um, not really available to us at the time. I mean, obviously it's priced based on transfer, and it's going. In, there's no management of instances, which is great because it's you could just spin it up and you and it's essentially it's faster free. Meaning, like if it doesn't actually live up to the transfer speeds that you would get on just through normal S3 uploads. You actually, it, it could be free. Um, I would let Alex kind of explain that more. <laughs> but um, so we ended up using that, and it's actually been very helpful for us because um, Grand Tour, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that show. It's our brand new, uh, very fun uh, alternative to Top Gear. Uh, it uses the S3 transfer acceleration to actually move content into Dublin region. Uh, buckets from London, 
And then we actually can transfer that content over to SFO buckets, where is where our digital asset management system resides in Northern California. And the speeds are amazing, and the, the price is virtually, you know, free for us. Um, it's actually really great in terms of like it's been a very um, solid way for us to move content from regions far away and to get it into our management system very quickly. But there are some considerations that we realized when we started working with these massively large UHD files. Obviously, files are hundreds of gigabytes an episode. Uh, again, going back to Man in the High Castle, we're looking at something around 280 gigs for every single episode, and that's just one version. We, of, we often re-version shows quite a bit for different regions. Um, and the cloud has limits, and I'll get to that in just a second. So what we, what we really wanted to do with these considerations is make things as fast as possible. That's the number one goal. Unfortunately, I, I would love a little bit more time to process my content. Um, and fortunately, um, if they lock a cut on Sunday night, I better have it uploaded into AV on you know Monday morning at 9 a.m. Um, it's not that tough, but it's essentially, it's a very quick turnaround that's expected of us. Well, what we ended up doing was when we started actually putting stuff up and then we ran it through the elemental server through that dam that I had kind of touched on earlier, we started to realize that we ran into some very unexpected issues. And that's where you kind of have to be ready to MacGyver solutions. Um, so again, what UHD files are big. Elemental is in an AWS. Our assets are in S3. Elemental can transcode directly from S3. So, so far, everything seems great. But there was, then we started to realize, okay, there's a maximum of 10,000 parts per upload. That's an S3 limitation, right? And Elemental, on their back end, had set part sizes at 20 megabits per chunk. So, if any of you are really good at math here, really quickly, 20 megabit chunks at 10,000 part limits is how big of a file? 200 gigabit file, or gigabyte file, sorry. Um, obviously, that's a problem for a file that is actually 280 gigabytes. So we had to then st suddenly start to realize we had to re-engineer um, how we are actually transcoding our files and moving them around within our S3 and elemental environments. So. And this is kind of like, uh, this is an example of uh, problems that you guys can definitely encounter when trying to build digital asset management solutions. So, um, and this is just a very good and solid example. Um, you guys would probably run into many challenges. Just be ready. So, unfortunately, because those, those files were over 200 gigs, they would actually fail to be rewritten back to S3. So we had to figure out that solution. What we ended, and I'll take one quick step back. We had actually chosen Elemental because of their ability to, you know, read directly from S3 buckets instead of having to pull down to local um, EBS volumes and then do transcodes. So we chose Elemental because we're like, okay, we don't want to waste time pulling elements down into local EBS volumes, doing a transcode, and then re-uploading them back into S3. That was going to be essentially a three-time hop. There's the first time up into S3, there's the down to the local EBS volumes, and then there's the backup to S3. Um, it was, for our file sizes, it was going to take hours, and it wasted too much time. So when we chose Elemental, we were like, great, they can at least read from S3 that cuts out one of our download steps. But obviously, we ran into this problem. What we ended up um, doing here is we built a three-step layer. We actually did transcode the assets in Elemental from the S3. Then we output to an actual um, EBS volume within the Elemental trans uh, like VPC. Um, we talked to Elemental quite a bit. We First off, our first question was obviously, can you up the, the chunks limit from 20 megabits to, you know, say 100? Um, they said, unfortunately, no, it wasn't going to be that easy that quickly. So what we ended up doing was 
spinning up EBS volumes for each node of, of Elemental that we would run. And then we would spin up essentially a 500 gigabyte vo volume. And we would transcode from there and output to that volume there. And then we just needed to push our assets from that EBS volume to our S3 buckets. And we did that simply through AWS CLI. It was actually, um, it wasn't an elegant <laughs> solution. It wasn't perfect, but it was actually effective. And today, as of today, we've already been talking to Elemental. We're already increasing those uh, chunk limits, and we're essentially working on bigger EBS volumes. And so we're already kind of working through those problems, but we actually had to figure this out in the short-term interim to kind of get our, process, our files processed. So that's just like a very long, you know, way of, a long example of essentially what you guys would face when you're actually designing a, a digital asset management system that's going to move these very large files around in a, you know, AWS or S3 environment. So I'm going to turn it back over to Alex to kind of summarize. Uh, I mean, I think that's a really good example from Aaron about how when you're building a system, sometimes things that worked perfectly before start to break. So in this case, it wasn't a matter of S3 not supporting large files. It's not a matter of the multi-part upload API being broken or bad or badly designed. It's an existing system, Elemental, which is a fantastic product, but starting to do more with it, working at a scale where you simply didn't work before. And if you start testing this, you think, oh, I'll just put through a small file. I'll transcode a 100 meg file because I want to just go back and you know have my life. But I really recommend when you start to do things, look at service limits you don't expect. Look at testing with the representative data, because you'll start to find things breaking and creaking at a scale that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So just keep that in mind, because it, it can bite you in ways you don't expect. So now we've got our assets. They're stored somewhere. We need to think about actually dealing with those. So I know I keep saying large files, and I know it's getting tedious for those in the audience who deal with terabytes on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the whole concept of moving around these files is very hard. If we think about the workflow of a typical hybrid solution, so many, uh, many content providers, many customers might already have an on-site storage platform, and then they'll have an in-AWS processing unit. Now, if we're dealing with this kind of content, uh, maybe a HD mezzanine, uh, if we're talking about 3 to 10 gigabytes, it's not very difficult. It's very easy for us to have an on-premise vault of all of our content, transfer in, process in AWS, and then push it up to a CDN, push it up to a partner, and push it up to somebody else. So having this kind of typical HD workflow is actually quite straightforward. It allows you to keep the TCO of your old platform, but when it comes to the migration of, or the processing and the scaling, you know, the important things that cloud does well, you still have that flexibility. So why is this actually harder with 4K? Well, let's just revisit an earlier point in an earlier slide. If we look again just at the highlighted bits here, sure, the mezzanine can be uploaded easily, but actually uploading that file which sits at 2.4, 2.5 gigabits per second is, is much harder. And of course, this isn't just one file. This isn't just one workflow. The problem is these files get moved around through many, many different points. And this is where we start to come to the concept of content gravity. It's a slightly overused term, but I like it because it, it's, it describes how processing moves towards content for a good reason. It's because the content weighs more than that processing. So really, the, the, the easy lesson, and you, please don't leave now, is um, get your files into one place and leave them there. If I look at what I've learned over the last few years and what I presented last year, I actually presented this very slide. Um, so I'm getting my content reuse uh, metrics up. But a lot of what I talk about here is processing without having to move files around. But there's one section in here which is actually incredibly difficult to deal with, and that is metadata. So in content management in media, metadata is one of the most important uh, and irritating things to deal with. So let's have a little bit of a deeper look for those of you not from a media background for what metadata means to us. So typically, it'll be in XML or a similar format. It'll have information about the assets. It'll tell you what it is, the duration. It may go into some details around the codec, so how it's encoded, the container. And you can then use this when you're building your digital asset management system or you're providing this to an upstream partner. 
Typically, nobody agrees on standards. There's more standards than there are for um, everything else. But you will have one within your platform, and you will accept many, and you will be careful with what you output. Now, just going back to this and looking here, I've just said, yep, extract and persist metadata using Lambda. So it sounds easy, right, because Lambda's easy. Um, so even with content in AWS, you still have that weight of content. You still have to think about moving it around. Moving a 300 gigabyte file, moving a terabyte big file is not a free operation. So we need to be more intelligent about how we analyze that content, how we process it. And the actual problem of metadata extraction is a little bit difficult. If we look at how you might have done this on premise, how you might have done this in a traditional workflow, you trans typically most things work on watch folders. So a watch folder will see a file come in, <clears throat> it will transfer it over to a processing node, it will read through that file until it works out where the metadata is because it is not consistently at the beginning, end, or middle, and it'll output it to a digital asset management system or something. Now, when I presented that slide year, last year, I had a very similar idea in my head. You know, you'd fetch a file from S3 um, in response to an event, you process it, read through the file until the metadata is found, and then you output it somewhere. But if you remember or know much about Lambda, you'll know there's a few restrictions there. There's a 500, gear, 500 meg local file system scratch. Uh, some studios don't like having files um, stored in Lambda because it's outside their controlled VPC. Uh, it will cost more because you're transferring an entire file. And as I said, because this metadata location is inconsistent, sometimes you will find it at the beginning and sometimes at the end, you're effectively streaming the entire file. And then at some point, you'll exhaust your Lambda execution time, or it just doesn't really work out too effectively. So this is where we enter with media info. First of all, it's free and open source. It's BSD licensed. You can use it, package it, and build it into your applications. That's good. The best bit about it is that it has curl functionality. You can give it an HTTP URL, and it will intelligently scan through that file fetching only small segments and persisting very, very little to disk. It will export to XML, and it gives you an incredible amount of information about that asset. An example test I did <clears throat> earlier processed a 1.6 gig video file in two and a half seconds and only used about 47 meg of memory. So it fits within the Lambda container, fits within the Lambda concept very well. And most of all, for Lambda, it is easy to statically compile, so you don't have to worry about external dependencies. So some of you may have seen this diagram, but this is a very simple overview of how you do the actual metadata processing with Media Info. Like most Lambda things, you get an S3 notification. At this point, there is a job that generates a one-time URL. This is passed to the Media Info binary. Media Info will then start to make those calls, scan through that entire file, and work out where to pull data. And then at the end, you can just output that to DynamoDB or whatever your platform is, whatever your digital asset management system, or even if you just want to persist and store that locally. And unlike my slide last year, this isn't conceptual. There is a blog post done by my colleague, and there's a link at the bottom there. So I encourage you to just have a go and see if you can get this working for your use cases as opposed to <coughs> running through the typical kind of uh, processing. So now I've got my content, I've stored it, I've extracted the metadata. Now what I need to do is store it and put that metadata into a digital asset management system or a workflow system. And this is, again, where Amazon Studios have dealt with that. So as Alex was saying, we needed to we need to figure out where to put stuff. Um, this is again going back to our digital asset management system that we have now uh, are instituting. Is we we architected this from the very beginning, and we said, well, it's obviously got to be on AWS because we want it to be scalable. Nothing better and more scalable than AWS, in our opinions. And obvious, and for us too, it definitely has to have an internal and an external integrations. Meaning for us specifically. Um, we can't just build a platform that works today. We need something that's going to be very uh, fluid and modular in the, in the sense that we can actually install new technologies as they come along and kind of deprecate old ones that aren't really working for us anymore. I'm thinking in terms of like 
uh, stuff where we're going to start to work with subtitling workflows, captioning workflows, where we're going to actually start to uh, parse raw footage information. And so, so we really wanted to make sure that our digital asset management system could plug into a bunch of different kind of workflows because it would be essentially open-ended in that sense. Um, and then, of course, orchestration is the main thing it's going to do, right? It's going to take our files. It's going to basically... Uh, build packages and deliver those packages um, at speed and at cost to all of our to our distribution partners. Um, again, in our case, essentially only Amazon Video, but we are already starting to distribute to other platforms as well. Um, we took all that and we kind of looked backwards, you know, starting from the customer, saying, okay, well they're going to watch it, and we got to give it to the partner who's going to send it to them. And we have to create packages that are correct for that partner. And we have to receive assets from our partners, from our post-production partners that essentially allow us to build those correct assets. So we kind of worked our way backwards, very Amazonian thing to do, of course. Um, so, and, and of course, it just needed to, to work as well. So really what I want to do now is kind of walk you through a little bit more in depth about Reach Engine and what it does. We knew we would. We knew that our VPC, and which, and by the way, our VPC is in um, SFO regions because it's actually the closest to Los Angeles and it works the best for us there. Um, we knew that that storage would have to be accessible from multiple locations and different sources. We have many post-production studio partners delivering content from around the world, so we needed it to be kind of very easy to access. And we needed that underlying infrastructure to reflect that kind of easy accessibility. Um, so, sorry. So again, working backwards, we obviously chose S3 because it was going to be the most easiest to access from the internet. And then we deployed the Reach Engine on that. And Reach Engine actually has a, a, a child product called Collaborate. And this is actually a, one of the reasons we chose them as well is it actually simplifies asset delivery into a digital asset management system, kind of eliminating the guesswork for, for vendors. Essentially, one of our internal Amazon Studios employees creates a task. This task is then sent to the content provider. The content provider simply clicks upload, matches the asset to this specific task, and then it's done. Um, it could not be more easy, and to be honest, that's how we progress and move the fastest. Because when we start introducing challenging ways to send content to us, even though they might be faster and, and a little bit better, um, it just ends up slowing the process down in a, in a huge way. So after we get those assets through the Collaborate, it basically goes into our ringed fence, our back end. Um, this, this ringed fence VPC exists again in SFO. Um, we have followed the tenets of the AWS well architected um, with our deployment so that we can control all of the aspects from securities to cost. Um, essentially, this is not public facing at all. Um, in fact, you can only, um, anything that resides in our VPC can only be accessed with Bastion hosts. And then those Bastion hosts are essentially not permanently running. They're only spun up when we need to access, and they're actually turned off when we're done. Um, and then because nothing is public facing, it's essentially there's no access to this content when we're not spinning up those Bastion hosts. Um, this is obviously to follow our, our security group rules and actually makes a very secure uh, dam for us. And just to also mention too, all of our S3 buckets are accessed through VPC endpoints which again, never leaves the, the uh, AWS network. So we really tried to architect this with the idea that we want it to be very, very secure so that piracy is obviously a big issue for everybody. We wanted to protect our content in the highest possible way that we could. Um, and I think we've actually done pretty well on making that work. So just to, I'll make one quick call out here too. Reach Engine uses essentially all these all these functions inside. MongoDB is the one thing that we are kind of very strongly encouraging Reach Engine to move away from and move towards Dynamo, DynamoDB uh, just because 
it's, you know, it's obviously, again, within the AWS network, Mongo is not quite, you know, up to our security levels that we want. And, but just to be also clear too, we only access those, um, we only access those through like dedicated like IMA users and stuff. So it's, it is still fairly secure for what it is. Um, the next step is once it's in Reach Engine, we actually then can start working with all that stuff, pushing everything to Elemental, doing transcodes there again across AWS. No, it's never going outside of our environment. And then everything has, is kind of runs back into this. And then the final step is obviously to deliver those assets completed to Amazon Video, which we essentially use bucket to bucket transfers uh, th over S3. And there are other ways, of course, we could use, again, going back to Aspera, Signant, or other things. Um, it just obviously happens that Amazon Video is also use, utilizing S3. And we're just kind of keeping everything together. And again, we designed this specifically, or at least my solutions architect did, and designed this thing to be the well-architected well tenants, to follow those, to keep everything as secure as possible, and to keep it in AWS at all possible times. Um, we didn't choose Elemental you know, just because they're an Amazon company. We actually did choose them because they were you know, the, the best solution for us. Um, again, going back to that earlier problem, we weren't actually, um, we didn't want, because they could transcode straight from S3 assets, or you know, that was a big plus for us, and they actually handled UHD. 4K content quite often. So it's it it kind of a win-win situation for us. Um, so that's kind of like the storage architecture of our entire dam. Um, again, keeping it in that ringed fence was the, the most important thing here. And whenever you're designing those dams, that's the number one thing is if you're going to start to pass MPA uh, security protocols and even higher levels, Marvel, Disney, they all start to have these very, very tight, tightly like guarded content dams. And by us following those well-architected you know, tenants, we've actually designed a system that we feel is essentially very, very secure. I'm gonna pass it over back to Alex to talk about the, the next steps. Thank you, so I, I think this is a really, again, a good example of where the traditional approaches of pushing things through a file system, transferring files over an RPC or something like that, they, they do start to fall apart a bit. If you Actually, if I just show you there, if you look at everything in this uh, diagram, you notice it's connected over REST APIs, or the S3 to S3 transfer is over an HTTP API. Because if, with you, when you have distributed systems, doing anything over the more tightly coupled RPC style or any kind of POSIX style access and F opener and FC just starts to fall apart. So when you're building these larger platforms, just treat an object like an object. That's why I love the approach that Media Info have taken. Don't be tempted to do things like S3FS. And as with many reInvent talks, we release products the week that we deliver talks. Um, so with newly launched ability, um, sorry, many of the newly launched abilities, think about the way that you're going to use them and make sure you're being true to the tenets of that architecture as opposed to trying to use the wrong tool for the wrong job. So now we've got our assets ingested and stored. Now we need to actually take them from that quality level and start to process them. So processing things faster and scaling in AWS. Now this is a 400 level talk. I don't need to teach you to suck eggs. So I'll just quickly run through. As with anything in cloud computing, we can apply those different approaches to scaling. First of all, you can change the physical size. You can make it larger. That's easy. And then you can add more of them. You can do horizontal scaling from N to NN. Also quite straightforward. But then something that we sometimes forget about is diagonal scaling. I don't know if there's a better word for this, so please email me afterwards if there is. Um, but where you effectively change the type of your instance to fit and be more specialized. So I'm going to start with diagonal scaling and, and just talk about this a little bit. So when you think about processing video, you will probably say, hey, you guys just launched Elastic GPU. That's brilliant. Let's use that. For those of you familiar with our G2 or P2 instances, 
and they use NVIDIA Grid or NVIDIA Tesla cards. Um, both of these use uh, an architecture called Kepler. Now, there's different supports for different encodings, different decodings, and different processings across different architectures. Within 4K video and within video at all, a lot of video is encoded with H.264. It's a fantastically efficient protocol, but 4K tends to be HEVC. And what you might notice there is that there is no HEVC support. So what this means is today, with the Elastic GPUs and the P2 and G2 instances that we have, we can't use that hardware acceleration because we need that for the 4K video component. So what can we do instead? Well, you can scale bigger. You can go back to the old instances, as the, the old idea of do it on CPU and scale bigger. So I thought I'd actually do some benchmarks around this. And I wanted to compare a generic instance, an M4 large, with a very power, or a much larger instance in the same family. And I found that there was an order of magnitude difference between these. I get a, less than a frame per second from a standard M1 M4 large, and I got over eight from an M418 X large, which was great. But there's also an order of magnitude difference on the pricing. You will be aware that M4 is not CPU optimized, and GPU process, uh, sorry, uh, video encoding is not particularly memory heavy. It's on a frame by frame basis, and the individual encode doesn't tend to use more than the pixel space of a single image. So I thought I'd look at the largest CPU instance, and actually, while it doesn't encode slight, uh, quite as fast because it has a small or slightly lower uh, CPU, it does give me a much better price point. So if I look at this from just a straight, I made up metric names, you can see that the ATEX large actually works out significantly cheaper for a cost per content hour than the M4 18X large. It does take slightly longer, but if you do a like for like comparison, it fits in pretty well. However, having spent a long time of my career, a long part of my career as a admin for big spark boxes with lots of threads, I enjoy things like this. There's a lot of threads, which is great. You can do lots of processing, but the interruption of a single process, the degradation of a single instance, can mean the loss of a job, which is incredibly frustrating if you go back to the idea that you can do eight frames per second, and if you're assuming a 60 frame per second file and it's two hours long, you're gonna have a bad time. So what can we do here? Well, the other problem also to keep in mind is that there's that upper limit. The largest I could go at that point was C486 large. Uh, maybe we launched some new instances this week so we can go higher, but you still have that upper limit. So that for us leads horizontal scaling. And many people know, oh yeah, I can do horizontal scaling for web workloads, I follow shared nothing architectures, I've got a really good stateless app, that's great. But what about for video? So first of all, let's have a look at what a video file actually is. If you take a, a very simplistic block level overview, it is effectively a container which contains different data streams coordinated by some metadata. You'll typically have one or more video streams and one or more audio streams, and that will make up a single file. And if we think about the bit that actually takes processing, it's just the audio streams and video streams because the metadata is, is easy and the containers can be swapped very easily because there's no encoding. So what if we took these sections and split them out and encoded them separately. We have one encoder deal with video and one encoder deal with audio. Okay, we've already made life a little bit easier. But audio processing is significantly easier. Dealing with audio processing doesn't win us that much. So what more can we do? Now, I won't go into too much detail about the way that a, a video file is built up, but effectively, it's lots of still images with occasional keyframes to align those. So we can think of it almost like a lot of blocks, a lot of chunks. So what if we take that one file, split it up into many chunks, and individually process those? Because we can actually think about a video file as nothing more than a selection of images with a fancy wrapper around it. So what we can do is we can parallelize the encoding at a chunk-by-chunk -chunk basis. First of all, we read the file in. We decide when to start encoding. We then encode for a specific amount of time. We output that newly encoded chunk onto a shared file system, and then something else groups this all together. 
There's a couple of interesting resources which I've linked at the bottom of the page. Obviously, this will be available on SlideShare later. And Netflix have got a great example of how they do video content processing with massive parallelization as well. You may notice I've said Amazon, uh, Amazon EFS or S3 here. I recommend the use of a shared file system where possible for the initial read, because an FC, again, over something like uh, S3FS is incredibly difficult. However, the individual outputs can just go straight into S3 or to that collation node. Now, to get us started, uh, I use the Jack of All Tools, which is uh, Jack of All Trades tool, which is FFmpeg or AVConf will do it just as good. From the top to the bottom, we say, dear FFmpeg, please start encoding at this time. I input my mezzanine file, my high quality two gigabit file. I then say how long I want my chunk to be. In my case, I've gone for 60 seconds. It's really, it, you can scale this as up almost down to a second if you felt the wish to. And then I'm using the x265 library for encoding. This is output to a TS file, a transport stream file, which makes it easier for me to group these back together later on. So now what I've got is lots of small files. And I can easily create a list of these, put it on a single node, and then on that node use a different filter, the concat filter, to group all of these back together. This is an incredibly cheap operation because the files are already encoded. There's very little video processing at this point. It's merely concatenating a lot of files together, writing the metadata around for the container, and outputting that somewhere. So I take my many, many individual files, I group them back into one, just larger video stream, then I insert that back into the container. So I've got it, that's brilliant. Now, some of you guys might be looking at this and thinking, oh, that sounds familiar. Taking a big file, splitting it up into lots of different things, processing it, and then putting it back together. You might be like, isn't that the same as Amazon EMR or any kind of MapReduce operation? And yeah, effectively, it is a very, very similar approach. You take a large, difficult to deal with problem, split it down into component parts, and concatenate it back together. You just need to be a bit more careful about doing, with this, doing this in video. I guess in summary, really, it's, it's about taking lessons we already know and dealing with other things and applying them to new problems. I'd love to get to the point where I have an EMR job itself, which handles the coordination, especially given some of the releases we've seen over the last couple of weeks, driving that innovation within EMR. And also don't forget that that parallelization step will make your life safer and easier when you don't have to worry about one interrupted encoder taking down an entire job. Netflix's example is that they have to do many different localizations, many different languages, and at least 10 devices. And if that was all being processed through one workflow, if any one of those failed, they'd lose all of it. So just think about that when you're parallelizing and do it as early as possible. So now finally, I come to the distribution step. Now from an Amazon Studios point of view, their life is quite easy. They only have one person, they, one person, one person they need to distribute to, and that's Amazon Video. So in their case, delivery is the same as ingest. And for most production houses, delivery is the same as ingest. For them, they can deliver to Amazon Video through an S3 to S3 bucket transfer, but also it really helps to be permissive in what you can do here be accepting and always realize that your partners, your upstream, are the ones who are actually calling the shots. So be flexible, use Aspera, use S3TA, and so on, because it'll make your life a lot easier. But effectively, you can reuse a lot of the investment you made in your digital asset management system for ingest to deliver to third parties. Now, for distribution to users, again, the kind of standard approach is have a CDN, use your adaptive delivery methods, have HLS, have MPEG dash, whatever. It's quite, quite straightforward. And it's very similar to what you had in HD. Now, just to level set for a little bit on what adaptive delivery looks like for anybody who isn't familiar, typically, and this is HLS v3, you have a manifest file. That manifest file has children manifests, which define the chunks for individual quality levels. So in my example here, I have one at one megabit and one at two megabits. And then below, I have these individual chunks. Your player starts playing one back. It'll select the top and then keep going through there. And it will adaptively choose the right bit rate over time using heuristics built into the player. And this is a pretty well-documented, very common use case. So again, as I said, it'll start going through 
select, and then switch bit rates as appropriate. Now, for 4K, this is harder but not impossible. Simple lessons are things like keep your content closer to your users, but as you, if you're using a content delivery network, naturally you want it to be cached closer to them. But at this point, cache width becomes a problem. Because this can be in two ways. First of all, if you have 63 edge locations worldwide and you have a user selecting, uh, querying through every single one of those, that means you have 63 calls to your origin. This week, we launched regional edge caches, which make the next 15 slides completely redundant. But if we didn't, what I will be talking about here is this. Um, but with, those, with that wide regional, uh, sorry, that wide cache width, you do need to think about the origin side. But secondly, you also need to think about the population for your end users, because you're constantly racing to fetch the net chunk. I mentioned uh, that I'm based in Asia Pacific. I live in Singapore. We have an AWS region, and we've got a CloudFront pot, which is fantastic. However, even though the connectivity between S3 and CloudFront is good, we haven't yet managed to solve the problem with the speed of light, so there's some things that you need to think about while you're dealing with this, especially if you're dealing with a country or a, a group of people with a big diaspora. So a good example is if you have content stored in the US, but then you have a lot of consumption in the Philippines. For every single one of those HTTP requests, it's incredibly chatty. And it's very difficult to ensure that the next chunk has been loaded before it's about to be requested. If it's not in good quality, people will just stop watching and go do something else. So how can we get around this? How can we keep our content consistently close to all of our users without the worry of content distribution? Well, you could look at doing things like S3 cross-region replication. But as you may know, this can't be chained. You can only replicate one level. So if I was going to store my content master in uh, Frankfurt and I wanted to chain everywhere globally, it's simply not possible. And the second problem is if I'm using Amazon CloudFront, Amazon CloudFront needs to address its origin by name. And S3 bucket names can't be duplicated. So if I have assets.alexjs.im, I wouldn't be able to have that same name in many buckets worldwide. So what can I do? And this is where I want to talk about one of my customers, which uh, are not in this room, so I can present this slide. They've built a way to feed the fire hose of content consumption by building mid-tier caches. They've built strategic layers inside EC2 regions worldwide, very similar to the regional edge cache that you will have heard about this week. They're doing a little more with it, but I'll start with them. This is built on EC2 and Nginx. They're also using Lua plus the AWS auth plugin. And they pull in, using one-time URLs, files into that. They have a wide, dedicated EBS cache. And this has massively improved their uh, local performance. Because it's pull-based, it only replicates when needed. So you don't have to worry about, hey, I've got my new file. I'll push it out to all of my regions. And because they've been clever and they, uh, they've implemented it with software that's extensible, it gives you the ability to have further logic and be able to do more things. So we've got this intelligence in Nginx. What else could we do to improve that performance? So if we look at this model again, a stream is really just a, a collection of chunks. It's just a collection of TS files or similar that are pulled sequentially. What if we decided to proactively prefetch? Because we know we're on chunk one now and we're on the lowest bit rate. It makes sense that we start on the lowest for that quick channel change, that quick playback. But then over time, we want to go up. So what if we start to prefetch those files proactively? Because we've already got this intelligence layer in place. So Spool, the company I mentioned earlier, make a Lua syscall from Nginx every time a request for content comes in. They persist that URL that is requested to a queuing service running locally on the same EC2 instance. They could also run that on SQS. And then there's a queue worker running on each of those mid-tier servers which reads the queue, builds every possible URL that they would want to request, and then executes curl locally against that node. This pulls the content in, and it improves the performance. And because they have the control, they say we want various different renditions, which all kick off, all these requests happen without the user having to do it. And this means that by default, the end user performance is better because the end user's request isn't blocked on these requests coming in. Because if we're pulling in six different segments all at once, 
it enables our customers to have a lot more uh, change up and change down. So just to put some numbers in from Spool's data, thank you very much, Daniel Muller, if he is in the audience. Um, this is their kind of, um, this is how their data looked when they were doing straight against CloudFront S3 with a global distribution. So again, content stored in the US, consumption in, let's say, Singapore. Average is around eight to nine megabits per second. Now by adding in this caching layer, they were able to, uh, caching plus prefetching. Well, you can see that the first file still pulls in at about eight. The next files, the sequential files, pull in at 100 megabits per second. In Singapore, a place where I have a gig internet for $50, this kind of performance is very important. So we can see that they've taken a really intelligent approach of building a system to meet a very specific need, but then looking at that and saying, hey, what else can we do? How can we be customer obsessed? How can we start to do more with the intelligence and the logic we have? If you have that layer, look at something else to do with it and build on top of it. So really now to wrap up, I've said it quite a few times, but 4K has the same problems, but at a scale where things start to break in ways you simply didn't expect. Make sure that when you're testing things, use the same approaches, but start to modify, but test with that data of the actual size that you need to. We're still building in this space. When I present a 4K talk at reInvent next year, I intend to have live video editing and drones on stage, but we're about a year off. Um, but all of the new trendy stuff aside, m and &E and video is still quite a traditional industry, so it's actually quite difficult to drive that innovation. Things have to work first and then be innovative. And that's where people like Amazon Studios will be able to set the way and give people confidence that they can do that innovation. So just, again, to recap the things that I've covered today, when you are ingesting, things will break at scale. So test with data that's actually representative of what you have. A look out for API limits. Look for things that you didn't expect to break and make sure you've done that end-to-end -end test with files bigger than you ever expected to use. For me, I, I still encourage you to keep things API-based and avoid trying to treat an object like a file. Ensure that you're dealing with things in the way that they're meant to be, and avoid POSIX requirements within your application. Don't assume that you can do an fopen and an fseek on a file, because it's an incredibly expensive operation in certain cases. I don't need to say more than parallelization will help you in many, many ways when it comes to processing video content, especially because it mitigates your risk factors. And finally, feeding the fire hose, feeding the, the consumption can be incredibly difficult, but where you can reuse that layer, reuse the capabilities and reuse your ability to influence customers for good, improve your customer performance first and they'll stay. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along and uh, please enjoy your trip home and have a great day.